On its surface, Once Upon a Time in Anatolia is about finding a buried human body. A group of men are trying to locate Yasar, a young man around 30 who's been murdered. But here I'd like to examine how the burial of Yasar is not the only one the film is concerned with. As we get to know these men better, we learn how some of them have buried parts of their past too. The film's mastery is one of managing to entwine and uncover both. Excavating Yasar also excavate their personal problems as well. When that happens, the film leaves us with a potent question. Is it sometimes right to bury the truth if it's to avoid hurting someone? And especially so if that someone is a child? I think this is what the film invites us to consider, so let's dig deeper into how it's done. I think we should start with the murder. The man on the right, Keenan, is our suspect. He's promised the police to help locate Yasar's body. That's him up close on the night he's killed. For a long time, the search proves entirely fruitless. Hadi göster bakalım neresi? But eventually, he's found in this field where they dig him up. Then, a long report is written before he's brought back to do an autopsy. We learn that he's been buried alive, and that's where the film ends. The meat of the story, however, is not really in the search for the body. Instead, it's the many conversations that happen along the way. But I'd like to stop here first. In a moment without words, where the search party's doctor has to relieve himself and this happens. It might appear trivial, but with the film's theme in mind, I can't help but wonder what's suggested by the filmmaker here. Could it be an allusion to how Yasar's body is eventually found in the field? Just like the face is sort of peeking out from the rock, a tiny part of Yasar's head sticks out from the ground when they find him. I think the likeness proposes that the kind of event that we're a spectator to is somehow woven into the fabric of these vast, endless hills. For instance, listen to how the driver, Ali, depicts what it feels like to live here. Then there's the title, which he also refers to, suggesting something almost mythical of the landscape we're in. Zamanlar Anadolu'da diyorsun. Ucuda bir yerde görev yaparken, işte böyle böyle bir gece yaşamıştık dersin. Anlatırsın yani ne bileyim masal gibi. He? Haksız mıyım doktor? Öyle öyle. Öyle tabii. That makes this complaint from the village Maktar even more peculiar. He describes how those who have died are a nuisance around here. Yazın bilakis. Ölülerimizi biz ne yapacağımız şaşırıyoruz. Vallahi billahi. Niye? Kokuyor. Siz de hemen gömün canım. Evet. It's as if the dead have a hold over this village. And it makes the following even more fitting. Keenan is dreaming about the ghost of the man he's killed inside the Maktar's house. <laughs> in summary, could you say that here, in Anatolia, these men are about to face something from the past that's both cultural and personal? and that these issues are somewhat hidden, but are about to surface? Before we move on, let's also quickly look at this rather banal discussion about borders, related to the location of the body. Komutan, ne diyorsunuz? Kızılsulu mu oluyor burası? 
e, şöyle ki Sayın Savcım, <gülüyor> Hayrak Çeşme tam sınır noktası. Çeşmenin bu tarafı sarı çullu, bu tarafı kızıl çullu. Çeşmeden bize kadar bir çizgi çizdiğimizi varsayarsak, e, bu taraf yani kuzey tarafı kızıl çullu, güney tarafı sarı çullu. Efendim, e, yani yani tam anlamıyla ada parselinde bakarsak. Buranın kızıl çullu olup olmadığı yani kızıl çullu diyebiliriz ama sarı çulluya da giriyor efendim. Yani şu an... It seems to say that in this place we're in tiny details matter even though they annoy this prosecutor. So now that we painted a picture of the landscape we're in, let's start with what I previously called the meat of the story, namely the many conversations between the doctor and the prosecutor. Yani evli bile değilim sabzı be. Onu biliyor mu? Yani daha doğrusu. Evlenmiştim de. İki yıl falan oluyor herhalde boşanıp. O zaman iyi olmuş. The doctor also reveals he never wanted any kids. The prosecutor, on the other hand, tells the story of a woman in the end revealed as his wife. Ben 4-5 ay sonra şu tarihte öleceğim diyor. Ve hakikaten tam o tarih geldiğinde küt diye ölüyor kadın. Nasıl yani? Basbaya mı? Dedim ya, dört beş ay sonra doğum yapıp öleceğim diyor. Hamileydi yani kadın devam. Evet. Soon, the doctor wants to know if there was an autopsy, but the prosecutor insists it wasn't needed. Olur biliyorum. Ölüm nedeni belli olduktan sonra otopsi yapmanın nedeni yoktur ki. Ölüm nedeni belli çünkü. Kalp krizi. Ölüm nedeni belli olmasa, dediğin doğru. When the doctor follows up with the idea of her death being a suicide, his colleague seems very hard to convince. Kendini zehirlemek mi? <gülüyor> Nereden çıkardı işin doktoru? He is adamant that it was not, but it's clear that a seed has been planted. So near the end, he reveals that he cheated on his wife. We also learned that digoxin, a drug that could cause heart attacks, was available to his wife through her father. Sarı küçük tabletler. Right before they perform the autopsy on Yazar, the doctor also argues that suicides can be a form of revenge. That opinion appears to weigh heavily on the prosecutor. Bir insan, bir başkasını cezalandırmak için hakikaten kendini öldürebilir mi? Olabilir mi böyle bir şey? Ha? E zaten intiharların çoğu başka birini cezalandırmak için yapılmıyor mu? Sadece bir. As touched upon earlier, the dead seem to have a strong hold of the living in this film. Kadınlar bazen çok acımasız olabiliyor doktor ya. Vallahi. Çok. But why is their past even given so much attention when the film began as a search for Yasar's body? I think it's a consequence of their many similarities, meaning one story might shed light on the other. They're both tales of unfaithfulness for Yasar and the prosecutor's wife. And while Keenan killed under the influence of alcohol, the prosecutor too was intoxicated when he cheated. There's also the fact that Yasar's son will grow up without a father, while the prosecutor's daughter does not have a mother. And all this suffering is somewhat tied to this ancient idea brought up by the commissar here. Neticede olan çocuklar oluyor doktor. Herkes yaptığının cezasını çekiyor. That notion was alluded to earlier in this memorable shot. Now why would the filmmaker be so interested in a falling apple? Its most obvious connotation is that of the fall of man. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are thought to have brought evil into the world through the sin of eating the forbidden fruit. From there on, every generation after them inherits this original sin. It's the idea that we all suffer for what previous generations have done, just like these stories and the commissar points to. So is the filmmaker trying to say that sin is part of this landscape, just like these apple trees are? And let's not forget Eve's the one who's been blamed for this sin too, and with her, all subsequent women. In the film, we also encounter shades of such a mindset. <laughs> Muhakkak bir kadın meselesi arayacaksın derdi ve...
Although not necessarily related, it's worth thinking of how women are portrayed here. Apart from this phone call, and this barely audible mumble from Yasar's wife, women are mostly absent or silent. Like in this scene, where the Mukhtar's daughter simply glides quietly among the men, almost ghost-like. Again, it makes me think of all these words of this being a fairy tale. And maybe it's suggesting that women sometimes have a ghost-like presence in the lives of these men. For the prosecutor and the doctor, that's certainly the case. They both have strong regrets about what happened with their wives. But how does all that tie in with where the film is taking us? First of all, it feels like the dynamic between the prosecutor and the doctor means Yazar is not the only one to have an autopsy performed. Through careful questioning, it's an impressive mental autopsy that's done on a prosecutor's wife. And we've discovered that she may have killed herself as punishment for the prosecutor's infidelity. The revelation hits the prosecutor hard, making the doctor wonder if it might be best for a painful truth to stay buried. Even more so if it's to protect children, which could be why he hides what they discover about Yazar. What's on his mind as he omits this tiny but significant detail from the report? Is it an act of mercy for the boy who's either Yasar or Keenan's son? Maybe for the widow too. Is he trying to break an evil cycle? And what about this moment? Does the blood suggest his concealment has tainted him? Or maybe it's to remind us that the doctor is wounded too, and that they have something in common. He also fails to completely remove the stain. Is that meant to make us think he'll have this wound for the rest of his life? Was it the right decision to bury the truth? Or is this something that will come back to haunt the little boy no matter what? Just like the dead seem to do here in Anatolia. <laughs>